Um, so, so we talked about um, catalyst-driven stories and steady build stories. And Yangera has been a remarkably steady build story as you see them develop their bioturbated zone, and, uh, which is the lower cardium. And I'm kind of surprised Brian Schmidt didn't talk a little bit more about that this morning. But um, so uh, the, as Jim will attest, the hardest part about buying his stock has always been the chart because it just never stops going up. And, uh, but he does have a pretty big catalyst coming up. And I've mentioned this in, in the letter where he's got a big battery coming online in July. Uh, I think it's around 4,000 barrels a day. He'll give you the details. And uh, this has the potential to have a material uplift in his uh, production in the very near term. So uh, I really urge everyone to pay close attention to what Jim has to say today. Uh, hopefully there's some time left for questions. And uh, Jim, you are joining us for dinner tonight? Yeah, okay. Uh, so please welcome uh, Jim Ivaskovich, CEO of Yangera. And here he comes. So I assume uh, scroll forward is green. Well, uh, thanks everybody uh, for taking the time to listen to the Yangera story. Um, my name is Jim Avaskovich. I've been the president of Yangera since 2001. So we're a story that's had many, uh, many additions over time. Try to hand it uh, natural gas, dry natural gas. Um, got really good at some Rock Creek stuff years ago. And so the evolution of the company has been pretty interesting in that we ultimately found a play that seems to fit our skill set. So I'm going to jump right into um, the metrics of the company, uh, 85 million shares outstanding. Um, you can see our current market cap. Well, that was our market cap. We're about $500 million. Um, what's different about Yangara compared to a lot of companies is the insider ownership. Uh, we have been big buyers of the stock uh, throughout the piece. And uh, what I find, even the new uh, folks that, that join the company, uh, we insist on them being owners. Um, tends to make them stick around and take that call at five after five uh, rather than dashing out the door at uh, quarter two five. Um, you can see our uh, PDP numbers, and I got a laser. Um, you can see that uh, we've got pretty nice, pretty nice numbers, uh, 88 million, 87.9 million, 2P. Um, and uh, that number has grown uh, considerably over time. The, the other, part that's really important about this story is our inventory and I'm going to get into some more description of, about that later in the in the uh, slide deck but we have a lot of inventory uh, we've booked about a third of it so there's lots of upside um, in this play for us uh, the management team is very static uh, we're um, a very low GNA shop uh, uh, the, the group currently is 14 uh, people in the Calgary office. Um, the, uh, the senior folks uh, have been with the company for an extended period of time. And we put this team together. Uh, these are newer people. They weren't around back in 2001 when we started. Uh, these guys are handpicked for the job at hand. Uh, board of Directors, uh, again, very static group, very able, business-focused, practical, common-sense guys. Why own Yangara? We, we cost, everything we do is focused on full cycle rates of return. I'll get into our full cycle allocation model, but with that focus, it it prevents me as a CEO from having a lot of those great ideas that we CEOs get that don't turn into uh, adding value to the owners of the company. Uh, so 
we have a very specific modeling program and it really focuses the entire team on will the company and will the shareholders be in a better position after we make this capital allocation uh, than we are right now. And so consequently, it, it's been very effective. Uh, very low cost operator, um, cash costs in the Q1 of uh, 2018 uh, were $14.06, operating costs 805. Our peers are typically 10 to $15 in the same area. And the way that we've managed that is, is structural. We operate different than a lot of folks. Uh, most, most operators in our area will run, uh, elect, will electrify their locations. Power bill is $1,250 a month for that. And our, uh, our friend Ms. Notley in Edmonton is uh, intent on making sure that 1250 is much higher in the next while. We use natural gas. If we have a pump jack, we use a natural gas engine. The natural gas is free to us. And of course, as we just heard from the last presenter, natural gas is not worth much. Um, other things that we do is we don't pipeline our crude. Uh, we, we have central batteries. Uh, we're just currently building the third one. Uh, we own uh, a bunch of oil trucks company employees driving them and what that structure does for us is gives us an opportunity to aggregate the oil in a place that makes sense, gives us an opportunity to be able to truck it to the best possible, best priced output. You noticed, uh, I'm sure you've noticed recent or uh, remember recently TransCanada had a problem with their pipeline, the Keystone pipeline going south. When that happened, everybody was under apportionment. If you were tied into a uh, pipeline and you had a 50% cut back in your apportionment, you're stuck. We already haul, we know all of the outlets for our oil, so we just rerouted trucks to where it made sense. Uh, royalty costs are reasonable. Uh, the uh, royalty framework, uh, framework that uh, that same Ms. Notley brought out is actually pretty conducive to this play. Uh, it's 5% on the, on the C-star value. So essentially, we get almost two times what we put into the well of income or gross income uh, before we have to start paying accelerated royalties. g and costs, as I outlined, are uh, reasonable just because um, we don't have a large staff. We don't target g and &A. That's just how many people it takes to run these assets. Um, so that said, break-even pricing, uh, $23 if you include the reserve replacement cost. So while we wouldn't be drilling in a sub-$40 market, theoretically, we, we would still be making money. Uh, we're very focused on operating margins. As you can see, last quarter, 67%. A cash flow, uh, 63%. And that's a bit lower than we normally see. Uh, but we had some hedging losses, and uh, hedging losses are fine with us. When we put the hedges on, we were happy with that price. Now they're higher. Uh, that's just fine. W our low-cost philosophy has been there for um, many years. Our operating costs have been $8 a barrel for the past eight years. So it wasn't like we had a bunch of fat we needed to come cut out of the system. Uh, when the commodity price went lower in uh, 2014. So, this is the most important slide, I believe, in the price deck. Uh, this is where we um, take a look at, at, at how the company is performing. In uh, 2013, we adopted a full cycle capital allocation model and what that is, is rather than concentrating on half cycle, and you need to know your half cycle to sort out your full cycle, but rather than concentrating on that, and uh, CEOs like myself are all promotional, you tend to take your best well, half cycle is a big giant number, and that's the only, uh, that's the only well we talk about. Well, we don't wanna do that, we wanna talk about all the wells, all of the inputs, the land costs that we put into uh, into the, uh, into the mix, 
pipelines, plants, that kind of thing. And as you can see, we had very good returns. We went back and calculated full cycle returns for 2010 or for 2011 and 12. And as you can see, once we got to 2016, something very dramatic happened. And what that was, was we uh, happened upon drilling bioturbated cardium. So I think what's important, I know what's important to me as a shareholder is that Yangara had a very strong, robust business plan through this period, got a lot better in 2013, and we fortunately happened upon a very uh, unique, interesting, and very profitable um, approach to drill and cardium. Um, as I said, in 2013, we adopted a full cycle capital allocation model. And you can see this is a slide depicting our inventory of cardium land. And I can tell you a couple of interesting things happened when we adopted that, that process. First thing we discovered was that the cardium by far and away provided the largest full cycle rate of return. We immediately stopped drilling all the other reservoirs that we were drilling at the time. We were doing Rock Creek, Second White Specs, Viking, a couple more, oh, Glock, Holy Glock. All of, those, all of those plays, while periodically providing really high IPs and quite often really high half-cycle economics, they didn't stack up to the cardium when you, when you applied it to a full-cycle model. So with that, we started buying cardium uh, inventory. We got lucky in 2014 because the commodity um, prices went way down. Everybody got uh, uh, despondent about the industry. Our balance sheet was fine. We knew we had a play that was going to work. And the folks that previously wouldn't sell you, us property now would because even the big guys and the rich guys didn't have money. So they were all ears when we came to them, uh, presenting them with deals on adding cardium inventory. So this is the uh, area map and uh, it's a bit, easy, a bit difficult to see, but I can tell you the town of Rocky Mountain House is right about there. Uh, Red Deer would be just over here, 45 miles away. Calgary would be down here at near the pedestal, Edmonton up at the top. So we're in a pretty localized area. We've got a lot of assets in this area. We have our own crew trucks, skid steer loaders, picker trucks, pressure trucks, oil trucks. And what that does is really help us drive down those op costs. We're not relying on third parties. We're not paying higher prices than we should. And all of those folks are company employees. So um, if they get stuck on a job that you would normally try to cut short because the bill was getting too high, we're not worried about it. The guy's making thirty-two fifty an hour, and we've got a little diesel fuel in the truck. Drive on. So what we're doing right now is just continuing to bolt on acreage um, to this map. We have, uh, last year we bought 27 sections. And, and to just put it in perspective, last year I think we drilled, it would have resulted in about 35 to 40 one mile locations, uh, 27 uh, sections at eight wells per section is a lot of inventory. So every year uh, since we've got after the cardium, we've added three, four, five, up to 10 future locations for every location we drilled. And we were able to do that while still maining great full cycle rates of return. One of the things you can do if you buy too much land and you become land poor, it really drives down those full cycle rates of return because you put too much money out the door. So lots of access uh, over here in Red Deer, all of, the, all of the companies that you need to drill wells uh, are there. Uh, today we would have 180 people working on Yangara projects Got a couple drilling rigs going. Uh, frack spread, we're building a battery, trucking, all that kind of stuff. But access to those folks, to those services is really good here. 
approximate. The other good thing is I'm an ops guy. My, my background is operations. I can go to the office, work till 8.30 or 9 in the morning, drive to the field, uh, add some value, and be home for dinner. That works. Bioturbated. Um, so if you look at the uh, strip log here, this sandy stuff is this. A uh, little gamma signature right here. Um, we traditionally drilled right below that, just into the bioturbated. If you look at this map, that would be old well path right there. And when we were to, when we fracked these wells, uh, essentially it went up because the this sand isn't as uh, as brittle and and as tight as this bioturbated section below. And what is bioturbated? Uh, this this is what it looks like. If you see the light colored stuff, that's sand. Uh, looks pretty similar to this. When you're on the beach having a cold beer, I trust, and you dig your feet into the sand because it's hot outside, eventually you dig deep enough in the sand, you hit something hard. That's siltstone. And when this depositional environment occurred, probably happening today as well, the bugs would drill holes through the siltstone. And over time, those holes filled up with sand. And a few million uh, years later, when the oil, the oil in this cardium zone is generated in the second white specks, and as it moved up, it filled this sand the same as it filled this sand. But because most of our stuff is on the halo, it's tighter than the old reservoir. So this stuff is characterized by 0 0.01 millidarcies, uh, would make this desktop look like Swiss cheese. It's very, very stiff, very, very impermeable. A molecule will move through that at maybe a quarter of an inch or half an inch a year. So what we did on our very first well in 2016 is uh, we drilled it uh, significantly lower. Uh, as uh, I've explained to Keith, uh, it was a bit of an accident on our part. And then we went in and tried to frack the well, and uh, I must say, we got a real surprise. And that surprise is manifest on that last slide we were looking, or the slide we were looking at, where the uh, half cycle rate, of re or full cycle rate of return jumped up to 80%. So, once we did the first one, we immediately recognized what we had. Um, initial rates much higher than, than what we had got when we drilled here, uh, much oilier. Uh, we also found out that this rock is very, very difficult to fracture. Once you break it down, though, it's very brittle. So we get these really good fracks uh, with great IPs but not everybody can do it. You're, uh, you need 15,000 pound equipment, you need a lot of patience, and you need to know that you can actually get that job done. So we figured that out, and uh, it's, of course, working very well for us. And just a quick moment, if you look at this, uh, this schematic, this cartoon, you'll see in the upper reservoir, and we just talked about that gamma signature, you can see that in this particular instance, and I don't think this is necessarily reflective of our land, all of our land, uh, for competitive purposes, we use a slide that we think makes sense, but this basically says three million barrels of oil uh, in place on the section, and just over eight million barrels of BOE equivalent. When you, when you look at the bioturbated section, there's another 2.2 million barrels of oil, and another 6.1 million total um, barrels of oil equivalent in, equivalent in place. So when you look at this number versus what we were doing before, you can see that the prize is much, much larger. The, the other half of the picture has been trying to sort out what is the right frac spacing. So when we drilled our first bioturbated well, we were of the view that about 30 stages per mile, maybe 40 uh, was the right number. And today we're fracking a well that has 81 stages per mile. So 
massive increase in the amount of stages that we frack, and it appears to be linear so far. If we add more stages, we get more product. So that, that's been, uh, in fact, our current, our current uh, mandate is just to try and sort out what the optimum spacing is on the fractures, how close together we can get the wells. We've done several instances where we put the wells 100 meters apart, which gives you 15 wells per section. Uh, we've got a five wall pad going, uh, should, should spud here in about 10 days, where we're gonna put the wells 150 meters apart, uh, but in one of the wells we're gonna go to 100 stages on a mile. So we're collecting an awful lot of data and that really assists us with making those full cycle capital allocation decisions. So, what do these wells look like? So this is the type curve that we put out uh, a year or two ago. And you can see these wells look a bit different than a lot of the uh, light tight wells you see in that this curve is a bit flatter. And what's happened with that is we're seeing a lot higher pressures. We're curtailing the initial production uh, because we don't want the uh, molecules to go into a liquid form in the reservoir. So what happens is if your well bore pressure is really low and your reservoir pressure is very high, and once you get further out into the reservoir, if that pressure drop occurs in the reservoir, it becomes what we call water wet. And that really impedes the flow of molecules into the well bore. So we've had to take these wells because we're seeing pressures that we've never encountered before in the cardium cut them back, and so as a result, we're getting a much flatter type curve. This is the uh, BOE per day, and this is the oil portion. So when we look at the, the rates of return, um, when, we did this, um, when we did this chart, uh, $50 was a pipe dream as we know, uh, and not so much today. But you can see that this thing drives off half cycle return of 140%, if I read that right, 148. But then as you move on up into higher prices, um, those rates uh, get extremely robust. And one of, the things that, one, of the, one of the things that is working right now for us is, what effect is having a one mile versus a two mile gonna have as you as you plug in the various uh, commodity prices, we have a lot of uh, variation in how much oil uh, versus gas, a GOR. So we're putting together a lot of information that's going to assist us on the long-term um, long uh, program for the company. So production growth, uh, we've, had, uh, we've had exceptional growth. Last year, um, something in the order of 65% uh, production per share growth. We're forecasting, I believe, lower end of guidance for this year, um, something in the order of 55% uh, production per share growth. So we're not raising money, uh, so obviously there's a lot of free cash flow generated by this field. We're using that to reinvest, of course, our bank, our banking capabilities go up over time as we, as the company gets gets bigger. So we're seeing a situation where we appear to be very very sustainable. So product metrics like I'll figure this thing out. Production per share uh, growth are up. You can see the wedge of production uh, that Keith was talking about. Um, and I might take, just take a minute to, to, to chat about that. Um, so on the, uh, we're building a uh, compressor station and another oil battery. It's our third oil battery. Um, the first oil battery we commissioned July 1st, um, 2016. The second one we did November uh, 1st of 2017. And we've already outgrown it with this rapid production. 
Uh, the new battery will give us line of sight to 15,000 barrels a day. Uh, we've recently had to increase the size of the battery from 12 million, or the compressor station from 12 million to 20 million, just because a lot of the wells that we're drilling have a lot of, uh, a lot of extra gas. Now, I heard the last speaker talk about guys drilling for gas and what's going to stop us. And I can tell you the biggest problem is for folks like Yangara, nothing's going to stop us producing more gas because it's a byproduct. Um, if we can strip the NGLs out of it, I don't really care what we do with the gas. It represents 11% of our gross income. We're going to continue to grow because the NGLs and the oil that come with it carry the day. Uh, reserves growth, uh, as you might expect, if the production increases that much, uh, the reserves will also increase that much. Um, and so have I done myself out of question period? Um, you might get one, but you're, you're going to be here 4.30 or are you going to be here for dinner? I'll come back at 4.30. Okay. Good. That's it. Budget, capital budget, uh, production, nine to 10,000 barrels a day is the guideline cash flow, as you can see, 80 to 90 mil million. Uh, and uh, it's quite likely you'll see that uh, budget increased in August. Time up, Chief? 25. Yep. Yep. Yeah, we're looking at it. It's a really nice position right in the middle of our play. It's tied in. Uh, so far, the economics haven't been able to, to compete with, with Cardium, so we're watching. Uh, Shell has just tied two of their Duvernay uh, wells just north of us in, and they've, uh, we're meeting this week about tying four more of their wells in. What that's going to do for us, because they're coming through our facility, is give us a really good look at what the new style Duvernays look like and then we'll make a decision. Yes? Uh, we're guiding nine to 10,000 for the year. Uh, so exit will be north of 12 likely. Uh, 48%. We haven't done those numbers uh, yet. I mean, on the odd well, they pay out. I've seen a couple of them pay out twice in one year. Uh, the first 10 wells we drilled, I think they paid out in, in 10 months. A couple of years, perhaps, two and a half years. It's reasonably quickly. You're welcome.